Hey guys, it's Tom Box here. Welcome to MSD.TV. This is a bit of an unplanned video, but we have a new tournament policy effective as of basically right now, April 3rd, 2019. And we haven't had a policy update for some time now. The previous version, I believe, was version 1.4. This is version 2.0, guys. And uh, there's quite a few updates, but this video is mainly just a summary of things I believe you guys would care about more often than not. Some of the things that people are kind of misconceived on and they've kind of clarified in this document and I'm going to repeat and highlight those areas. There's even a specific area about hygiene and tournament tier seems to have also gotten revamped as well. But I think one of the biggest things that you guys care about would be the tournament play, specifically about hand knowledge and public knowledge and all that junk right there. So you know what? If you guys are gonna enjoy this, hit me up with a thumbs up and I'm gonna do a quick summary of that part. If you want a full read of the entire thing, that will be on a separate video. And uh, if you really want that stuff, it's mainly for judges, but if you don't wanna get screwed over by policy and know how to play the tournament on top of Yu-Gi-Oh, then that will be a video for you guys. But that's on a different time. Let's do this one right now. Now for the areas I'm going to cover in this video, I'm mainly going to be talking about spectators, which is in page 11, hygiene, tournament tiers, and tournament play. I will summarize tournament play because there's actually so much detail in here and it is like 10 pages long. Don't think I need to go over every single detail, but those are the main areas that do have some level of change or some level of elaboration for us players. Now, in the H spectator section, a lot of you guys have pointed out a certain contradiction. Now, I've kind of highlighted it and I'll try to break it down in a way that it actually makes sense where both conditions can be met. Now, according to the policy here, spectating an event is a privilege, not a right for tournament attendees. It is a spectator's duty to remain neutral while observing gameplay, so you're not you know, making signals behind people. That's why people are not allowed to crowd behind the duelist. It's just absolutely bad and puts them in an awkward spot and make sure that their presence does not disrupt the event the event meaning the entire thing don't go streaking in the event okay guys that is just bad and at the discretion of the judge spectating at a tournament may be limited or restricted so they can reduce it so they can minimize the crowd whatever that the judge needs to do okay so spectators must abide by the following rules spectators may should not speak to or communicate in any way with duelists who are currently engaged in a match. And if a spectator notices any violation of gameplay rules or tournament policy, they must alert a tournament official immediately. Call a judge, basically. In other words, spectators can also call judge. And spectators must be prepared to move uh, if their presence block a judge access through ways, fire exits, and or any other paths identified by tournament staff spectators will be asked to move if their presence is distracting to any of the duelists and if a judge and tournament and official instructs a spectator to move they must comply okay for the second two rules um the spectator should should not speak to or communicate in any way with duelists who are currently engaged in a match and then there's also the contradiction of if you know a spectator notices any gameplay violation or rules, they must alert a tournament official immediately. So you can't really talk to the players. It's not that you can't, it's that you should not. By should not, I think that kind of gives you a little leeway. By little leeway, I mean this. In the situation where you see an opponent or see a pair of players and one of them is basically violating gameplay rules. They're not resolving their effects properly. Basically, a procedural error is occurring and the other player does not notice it. What do you do? Do you let them go down that rabbit hole? And when they go down that rabbit hole, it could result in an irreparable game state, which elevates the problem and kind of breaks the entire integrity of that game. What do you do? Well, in past instances, and this is nothing new, these both these lines existed before. So, what do you do exactly? Well, a spectator can technically call judge, and if a spectator calls judge, are they disrupting the event? Well, it's still technically just the event running itself as normal, and if a spectator calls judge, or maybe you can tell them to stop, 
you can tell because this is not really communicating to them but you're kind of good letting them know a judge has been called to the table due to a violation of gameplay rules and it needs to be addressed you can kind of spin it out that way but uh it is a little bit subjective and there is like a bit of wiggle room for us to interpret how do we handle both these situations but um is it too bad so sad you guys let me know down in the comment section but i think if there's illegal moves happening in a move definitely call it just before it escalates too far where the game is basically irreparable where someone's gonna get a game while someone's gonna be upset but i again it should be again under the impression that you're being neutral don't be a hypocrite where you see that if your friend's doing it oh you just don't call it out but then oh all of a sudden you see the opponent doing something stupid and then you call a judge on them and it's like that's that's hypocritical and that's like obviously wrong and then there's also the media thing i'm not going to read over this pretty thoroughly because any me members of media i'm going to include youtubers here including myself who wishes to attend a sanction event or to uh, basically want to create photographs audio video they must follow the following rules contact the organizers ahead of time sometimes at YCS I've noticed that there's like a media corner where they're able to sign off uh, a document and they're able to record specifically in that area a media representative should be prepared to provide evidence of their association with news outlets blah 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 blah, blah. and uh, members of the media are responsible for all of their stuff and you know the tournament is not responsible for all their gear yeah yeah that's that's all cool next up hygiene section i have hygiene wow this is actually in the document now if you're a stank player just don't go to the event fix your problem you're not gonna get kicked out according to this document but you are required to fix the issue bring some clean clothes bring some Febreze bring something to make yourself a more decent human being please so according to the document here you are expected to be clean when you enter a tournament neglecting to wash or put on clean clothes contributes to an unpleasant atmosphere at the event as the tournament can be crowded and the day can be long Ooh, long stink okay so persons who neglect self-care to the point that they negatively impact the tournament may be asked to correct the issue in order to continue in the event. So you're not just gonna get evicted straight up just for and disqualified for being stinky, but you will be asked to leave. And I guess if you're asked to leave to fix your issue, all the other penalties still apply for tardy to your table, like, do you know what if if you show up at a table and you stink and someone calls judge on you like how, well, how much more do you need like don't you like i think i would be pretty embarrassed and to be honest in the past situation i was glad i was not playing a control based deck i was playing an otk deck that only lasted two turns and that's also one of the reasons why that's my deck choice at any regional if i had a choice between a control deck or an otk deck is because if you stink i just want to end the match as soon as possible i can't sit there you're gonna win the long-term grind because i can't grind through that smell and uh since people are asked to correct the issue i guess people can get called on for judge if someone stinks yeah <laughs> that's kind of funny anyways next up we have tournament tiers ah this is a pretty big change i guess there's new tournament tiers, but I guess there's no real major impact unless there's like, oh, a tier this it does something different. So they kind of sorted out the tournament levels before there was only like two tiers. It was the locals, which is tier one, and then there's tier two for all competitive events, which include premier events and included basically everything. But I'm guessing sorting it by tiers like this, it might be more for uh, Konami side, but there are four tiers of sanctioned events and official tournaments in konami digital entertainment us i think it's same for the eu as well uh organized play there's tier one which is casual this is tour uh the store locals and sneak peek and duelist league so it's not really major at all and then there is tier two competitive this would be ots store uh championships vip qual i don't even know what is this vip qualifiers Okay, I guess someone should inform me on this. I want a VIP qualifier. Uh, there is UDS qualifiers, regional qualifiers, all Dragon Duel events, and all card game extravaganza. So regional level tournaments, store, OTS, I guess anything that basically offers you an invite to somewhere, they are considered as uh, competitive events. And then there's tier three, which is premier events, WCQ, uh, nationals, 
Invitational for UDS and YCS's are all at the premier level and tier 4 which is the highest tier which is one of the most exclusive is the world championship they have their own policy. Alright tournament play this is the part I'm gonna summarize for the most part unless we get into some areas where they elaborate or they are different and new. Starting off with sportsmanship this is pretty obvious be respectful to everyone there just be a decent human being and don't upset the judges or endanger anyone because you could get disqualified or kicked out. Okay, and just read the uh, penalties uh, policy on that. Tournament, tournament registration, make sure you have all your stuff, your deck, your registration form, ID, card ID, your fee. And if you have an invite, make sure that you are invited before you go there. Uh, special assistance, if you're going to need assistance, make sure you do it before uh, or during the registration process uh, with a head judge or a tournament official. Deck registration, tier 2 to 4 events will require a deck list and you can find it online. And they elaborate on how to fill in your deck list because some people, and I remember this at YCS Niagara where people were filling in their uh, deck list. In Canada, you can fill in your deck list in English and French. That's acceptable because those are official languages. If you're in Mexico, you can fill it in in English and Spanish. However, if you are using a German card and you are in uh, Mexico or you are in anywhere else aside from Germany or uh, anywhere that German is a common language, uh, then you will have to fill it in their local language or in English. So you can't just be smug. One guy filled in his entire deck list in all German because he's playing a full German deck. I asked him to uh, refill his entire list in English so I can actually read what it is. Oh, and they also talk about abbreviations and shorthanding. If you're shorthanding something, make sure it's consistent for all the cards there. So Burning Abyss, like the mal branch of a Burning Abyss, make sure you can do something something BA. If it's going to be the same thing, just make sure it's consistent all the way through. That's about it, so that you don't have to be uh, confused. If you're going to be writing a card called Bottomless, it's not acceptable because there's some dis ambiguate. There's some like ambiguation. It could be several different cards of Bottomless, like Bottomless Shifting Sand or Bottomless Trap Hole. So yeah, make sure you're clear on this. I don't think there's another card called Warning just yet, but you know, you can type it in on your YGO Pro or whatever and see what matches the name. Uh, shuffling. This is actually kind of neat and a lot of people argue on this point, which is very silly. So I am actually going to be reading this. Your deck must be randomized using an acceptable shuffle method. Riffle, Pile, Hindu, etc. And then cut this full line kind of highlights everything must be done at the start of every duel or whenever a game require game mechanic requires you to shuffle i know some of you guys are thinking right now oh game mechanic requires me to shuffle therefore i'm gonna power shuffle my opponent's deck to burn down the clock yeah if you constantly do that you'll get a slow play warning i think you'll get a game loss after that if you really, like if someone calls judge he's been making me power shuffle he's been power shuffling my my deck for like i don't know how many turns like five six minutes yeah you know what there's legal there's like ample evidence for them to suspect that you are you know slow playing and uh you must be randomizing it thoroughly and where your opponent can see so no under the table shenanigans you cannot check or arrange cards while shuffling you cannot pre-sort your deck sorting monsters spells traps etc without thoroughly shuffling the deck afterwards why do you say so in other words you can pre-sort your deck then shuffle is that what it is saying well I guess it kind of means that it's like when you're side decking, you grab a stack of cards. These, this whole stack of cards is your side deck stuff. Where are you going to put it? Well, if you just stack it on top of your deck, now it's all clumped together. It needs to be separated. But in other words, your deck is kind of sorted in a way where that top clump will just all be side deck cards. And this is kind of giving you a little bit of leeway where you have to like pal shuffle them out and just randomize it thoroughly. It's mainly called randomizing for a reason because you don't know the order. It can clump up again, but that's after you shuffle and that's your own fault. And after something's randomized, there's a thing called the vinyl cut. This final cut is that after your opponent shuffles your deck, you can cut your own deck and then you have to present it to them to cut it. This is kind of like the whole Yugi Arcana thing. Only trust your opponent after you, they've cut your deck kind of deal. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, but that is something available that you can do. You can like do the final cut and you make your opponent cut your deck. Uh, just in case you think that they are trying to stack you in some way or form, it's just another level of security for you. And no additional randomization may be done after this point. So, okay, yeah, get it? 
And when you present that back to your opponent, you're agreeing that it's sufficiently randomized. So once you pass it back, that's it. All right. You're not required to keep and the side deck. Yeah, you're not allowed. You're not required to keep the side deck on the table. It can be returned to the deck box. If it, their side deck is in the deck box, the deck box must be viewable. All right. That's cool. All right. Determine who goes first. High roll now is now part of the example, but it's something you agree with. Make sure that you're using fair methods. So if you're going to use a coin, you both use the same coin. If you use a dice, make sure you both use the same dice. Okay. And if you decide who's going first, you do it beforehand and uh, before you draw your cards. Sleeves. Ah, they added this part into the sleeve part, so make sure that all your sleeves are consistent. The side deck and main deck must be in the identical color where in design and, uh, well, basically in the same direction. No upside down stuff. If your friend's borrowing your cards, just take a picture. And uh, looking at this. No highly reflective backs. That was established way back in the day. No holographic fronts allowed. All right. So if something's making something look DT, I'm sorry. Imperium Duelist sleeves will not be allowed if they have the holographic patterns. And uh, artwork in the front is also not allowed because it, well, it basically just blocks uh, card text. Okay. And card backs can be used if they're different. And uh, as long as they're identical and not offensive, a head judge can have final say. That's about it. And the extra deck, you can put it in different sleeves. This is mainly to minimize the amount of trouble that people have gotten for using the same sleeves before because in the same sleeves, see people shuffle in their deck when they're collecting their deck. And since the extra deck is so rampantly used now, it's like a common staple part of Yu-Gi-Oh! It just makes it so that people will shuffle it in. So as different as possible, it's good. Unless you know that your opponent's gonna be flipping stuff face down. They can be the same you may choose to put them in a different one. Uh, it doesn't mean they have to be, all right? And yeah, nothing much added there. Tournament materials, you have to bring paper, pencil, pen, all that's up to you. You have to bring them because things need to be written down. Here's something interesting. You cannot use a tablet or a writing surface that can be cleared instead of paper. All right, so no more iPads, no phones. And yeah, that's it. You can use a calculator to keep score, but it has to be written. That's why the whole, uh, they take precedent on paper over calculator. And replacement sleeves, tokens, make sure they're marked as tokens. OCG cards cannot be used as tokens unless you mark it as tokens. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, dice, coins, counters. Dice, they can't be weighed and uh, they can't be offensive. Same with coins. And as for counters, they cannot look like any other game elements on the on basically on in the game and field centers are encouraged game mats are not required and judges have final say on all of those things so check with the head judge if you think your really lewd image is allowed in tournament in the grounds it's up to you okay so field layout this is an interesting thing you're supposed to play using the official current layout i know a lot of people put their decks in the front and the judge can call you out on putting it back into the right zone because by putting a deck in the front and the graveyard behind and people always tilt their deck so it's a little bit more comfortable for them to draw sure but if you put a deck in the front and then the graveyard in the back the issue is your opponent has harder access and they cannot see your graveyard clearly because of it and if it causes any sort of accident where like oh your opponent's trying to reach for your cards and your cards spill over guess whose fault that is that is going to be the player with the deck that is tilted because you made an inconvenience and therefore caused an accident because of the way that you set up your cards. There are exceptions, however, to modifying the layout, which is to meet physical injury, left-handedness, uh, with the exception of tier four events. So if you're at Worlds, you would not mess around with the zone at Worlds. You will be given ample assistance to maintain that zone. And I can bet to you anything that if you're at a feature match, you're going to be forced to uh, to use the regular zones, especially if it's gonna get streamed or anything. And yeah, if you modify the layout, you're notifying your opponent for all the changes required. And uh, yeah, you have to maintain the position of the cards and they cannot be moved around like unless by card effects. Of course, of course, of course. Note taking, you can only take notes of the following and there's no other form of note taking allowed in any sanctioned or official Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG tournaments. Life points, keeping track of mandatory effect reminders, and keeping track of turns and turn counters. Now, this whole mandatory effect, yes, you have to keep track of it. And by mandatory effect, it just means that uh, if you're under Drone Lockbird, 
you may take a note reminding of people that you're under drone lock. So in other words, something that has activated that has a lingering effect is basically a mandatory thing that's happening. By mandatory, it doesn't just mean like triggers. It means anything that is completely mandatory at this point. Like if you got crush carded every single time, well not crush card, I guess deck dev, anytime you draw a card and you have to keep track of how many turns that thing lasts, that is something you can write down. And that's not something you forget. If you activate an effect that lingers and basically finishes resolving at the end phase of the turn, that is something you can write down. If there's like a search effect where it activates on the current current phase and then only searches later on, that is something you can write down because it's up to both players to keep track of this stuff. That's note taking, that is allowed. Uh, but not optional effects where, oh, the car got sent to the graveyard, has an optional trigger. Uh, you forgot about it? Well, that's too bad. But anyways, game state, again, both players are responsible for maintaining game state by clearly communicating with their opponent. Communication has been a huge thing about this whole policy. It's been an update and it's been a lot more strict with a lot more disqualifications if you lie. Lying is bad. Public knowledge, the following information is considered public knowledge unless a card affects states. Otherwise, a duelist may not refuse to answer questions about information that is public knowledge. Lying or refusing to answer questions about information that is public knowledge may result in a disqualification penalty. Look at all this DQ. There's going to be more DQs that they're going to be throwing around. And a duelist must answer questions involving the following topics. Truthfully, the number of cards in a duelist's hand, so your hand size, the deck size, main deck side deck, and extra deck, those are all public. And the number and names of cards in the duelist's graveyard and face up banish. Face down banish only the uh, controller of those, uh, I guess not controller, but the owner of those cards can check them. And a duelist can, I guess both duelists' life points total, any notes that anyone wrote down, and uh, any information printed on a specific card mentioned by name or otherwise clearly described. That just means even if your opponent asks you a, a question, if it's about a card, even if you don't own it, or it's some tech that they kind of expect. Oh, how many attack does uh, Diana Wrestler Pancratops have? Even though you don't run the card, if you know the answer, you just tell them. If you don't know, you don't know. Uh, even, so that's why even arbitrary cards. And normally if they ask you for anything specifically with a name, it's probably because you played it. And which, cur which cards were played in the current turn. That is very specific, the current turn. That changes the ways that you ask questions, and that has something to do with private knowledge. And specific about private knowledge, the following things are private knowledge. Information that may not be revealed by a duelist except by a card effect. Duelists may not answer questions about the game state that is consider considered private knowledge. Uh, card content still in the deck, per se. You, they, they can't know this. All cards that are face down, cards in the opponent's hand, and which cards... Uh, the opponent set or summoned in the previous turn. Basically, cards played in the previous turn, they cannot know unless it's like a mandatory effect that everyone needs to know, like, oh, you're still under like card, like a uh, deck dev or something like that. That's still fine. But which cards they previously set, you can't ask them. Oh, so which one of those, which one of those cards did you set last turn? If you ask that question, yeah, they can refuse to answer you. That is fair game. But if you ask them which card was set in the current turn, that, on the other hand, they have to answer, and you can deduce which one was set back. So you don't have to do do work. Well, you don't have to kind of cheese your way through. Uh, giving information or false information that is considered private knowledge or intentionally revealing information that is considered private knowledge may result in a disqualification. Another disqualification area. In other words, if you lie, you will be disqualified. You lie to a judge, you'll be disqualified. You lie to your opponent, you'll be disqualified. You lie to your opponent yourself you will be disqualified so yeah there's tons of ways to uh totally just mess mess around and get yourself screwed over that's not it's not fun you don't need to do this okay here's the part that a lot of you guys are upset and that is the card hand deck verification people are upset about this why it's because of mind crush mind crush you call a card name and if they have it they ditch it into the graveyard they discard it if they don't have it well they don't have to show you anymore. You may not ask a judge to verify your opponent's hand, deck contents, or face down cards unless there's supportable evidence that your opponent may be cheating. Wow, very specifically cheating. Or there may be a valid deck related issue. What did they talk about here? Because you may not verify or search any of your opponent's private knowledge location. That sounds so, so weird. Uh, such as hand, deck contents, or face down cards unless you're 
uh, otherwise directed to do so by a card effect. This whole thing kind of messes around with uh, Mind Crush because Mind Crush does not state that. Does not state that you look at your opponent's hand. It's not like Trap Dash Shoot where you do get to look. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go down here. So yeah, if you search a card, yeah, you, you have to show it to your opponent. Anything that you search, you have to show. And here's something interesting. If your opponent activates the effect of uh, Mystic Tomato and upon searching his deck, he realizes he does not have a legal card to special summon, your opponent doesn't get to check the deck to verify. How, like the thing that was different before was that um, if you had a mandatory effect like Sangin and uh, you, you can't search, because uh, there's no target, but even though Sangin, Sangin is mandatory, you, your opponent gets to look through your deck. I don't know if this still kind of applies here. Uh, it doesn't kind of go through Sangin anymore since Sangin isn't commonly played. Uh, but I think you can call a judge on that because that one has a mandatory card effect to, to kind of make them add a card. But this one, because I'm guessing it's kind of optional, maybe? I don't know. Maybe I'm just over-interpreting this card. Ah, get, this one kind of talks about rarity, super rare versions of a limited spell, and then they see the same limited spell, but in a different rarity. Yeah, you can call a judge on that. That's really, that's super sus, man. That's that's just, that's just sus. Okay, so here's the Mind Crush part that you guys are probably waiting for. I've been going on about this for 16 minutes straight. Mind Crush. Player A activates Mind Crush, declares Effect Veiler. Player B says that she does not have Effect Veiler. Player A does not get to see the Player B's duelist. Uh, well, Duelist B's hand to verify, and they cannot call a judge to verify because there's no supportable evidence that they may be cheating or there may be a valid deck issue. Okay, that uh, seems fair, kind of, but you guys get the issue where there's the not the no confirmation thing. It's the same with the ABC structure of uh, C and B. If C, if your opponent activates C and then they go with that with chain link one and then they go B chain link two to add the target and then they summon out the target. C needed a valid target ahead of time. And that's, if you see them like set every card and they have no cards left in their hand, that's when you call a judge say, and then they will likely get disqualified for cheating. Yeah, I guess they're a lot more strict now. But in the other case where they activated Pot of Duality and then they revealed an Effect Veiler, they added to hand, they didn't use the Effect Veiler for the longest time, and then you know that's still in their hand, you can activate Mind Crush to declare Effect Veiler. Player A states that there's no Effect Veiler. Essentially, Player A is essentially just lying, and now there is supportable evidence because of Pot of Duality's ad. Um, well then, you can call a judge, and the judge can investigate. Yeah, so I'm guessing they are already answering your question right here. But that means there's still that loophole where people can still get away. If you think about this, this doesn't cover all cases. There are cases where someone's just gonna straight up lie. But if they did, they do lie. This kind of ties back into the spectator part. A spectator can just call judge and it's GG for this guy. Sure, the guy might hate you and uh, hopefully he doesn't do anything illegal to you because he's cheating and you know he's already got a kind of a cheater characteristic i'd just be a bit more careful when he leaves the event all right guys just watch your own backs when that happened i i i really hate how things escalate out of hand and just outside of Yu Gi Oh when that happens but you know if someone's cheating they get called out for it and spectators can call out people for cheating as well and uh, okay appeals if you disagree with a floor judge's ruling because you think it's not the correct one yeah you can call for a head judge to appeal it and head judge's rule is always final. All right. But you may not appeal a floor judge's ruling until they have given the ruling. This is actually uh, more towards supporting the judges because a lot of people just only want the head judge ruling over. They don't want to accept someone else's explanation. It is uh, kind of annoying as a judge myself. Like, oh, I'm about to give you a ruling. I never had that issue before because anyone that calls me over, they already know who I am. and. You guys can appeal me if you want, if you think it's not the correct ruling. It's fine. It's par all part of the gig, really. And conceding matches, if you, you can only concede up until the point you actually win. If you win, you can't concede anymore. And here's the thing. This whole statement is so full of loopholes. Like, you have no idea how much loopholes there are in this statement where you can still concede a match. Just don't play all the way through just give up before then. if you're gonna give away the win anyway just don't play all the way through all right if you finish all the way through and your opponent catches you you're just in trouble this is dumb bribery collusion don't fix your match basically don't take packs or money for for winning 
this I wish they would enforce a bit more on the LCQ last chance qualifier because this is the biggest issue here uh, with the LCQ is that there's quite a bit of bribery going on and I need I wish people just cash this more often random outcome you can't roll a die for stuff if you get caught you'll be disqualified and if someone offers you this thing you just decline them and tell a judge and they'll be disqualified I had that opportunity to disqualify someone but you can also save someone from disqualification by pretending you didn't hear what he was saying then you say he didn't offer me anything all right that's one way to save someone and I intend I guess I kind of did that for someone at one WCQ uh, intentional draws that can't happen okay just don't do it this I guess at ARGs you can have intentional draws I could be wrong you guys can update me on that and the reporting the match slip and the match procedure that's just time rules oh man so much to go over all right guys if you guys are still with me here give yourselves a pat on the back tiebreakers they actually explain how the tiebreaker system works that's really good this is a number X X X Y Y Y Z Z Z uh, the double X is the number of points you've accumulated. Y, Y, Y is your opponent's win percentage. Uh, and then Z, Z, Z is your opponent's opponent's win match percentage. So it kind of comes down to, oh, I've got this number. Okay, whatever. Like, does it really matter? You can't really control your opponent's win rate anyway. And tournament infractions, just read over the, uh, the penalty documents if you want any details. The only thing that we really want to know is tardiness, and that's about it. And they actually put in a thing called wagering in here. Uh, make sure you're not gambling on the site, like gambling for cards, money, packs, whatever. If you wager, you will be kind of kicked out of the event, I'd say. And I think you might just be straight up just banned. I don't know. I didn't look at the penalty document updating on wagering. But yeah, that's all I have to cover, guys. Ooh, thank God we made it all the way this far. If you guys like this video covering the tournament policy, Hit me up with a thumbs up, guys. You know what to do. If you guys want to see more stuff from MSD.TV, I've got the Endymion stuff coming up very soon. I am definitely going to be focusing more on Endymion. And I even got a bonus video for you guys this Saturday, which is extremely rare. I rarely get to do back-to-back -back videos like this. I think I did, what, four videos in a row this week, which is unheard of. Well, give me some love there and uh, smash that subscribe button. Stay up to date. I don't know. There's going to be a lot more policy ruling stuff coming up as soon as new products come in. And yeah, well, that's all I got for this video, guys. So stay safe, stay honest, I guess. That's the whole theme of this uh, this whole document here. And uh, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay tuned for all the new duels and profiles coming up. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please drop us a like so we know we are doing a good job. And you can also subscribe to MSD.TV for more fantastic videos by clicking on the button on the left. Don't forget to check out our partners at Imperium Duelist. They make really high quality mats, including some of my own limited edition release stuff. And if you want to check out one of our past videos, click here on the right. As always, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV and I'll see you next time.